Okay, in chapter 14, we're going to look at the Patriot Act, foreign intelligence, and other types of electronic, electronic surveillance that are covered under federal law. So <clears throat> let's talk about eavesdropping, right? <coughs> if you're aware someone is listening, the burden is on you to make sure they're trustworthy. So under the misplaced reliance doctrine, there's no need for a warrant if one party consents to a tap or if they are the police. And this rule covers both persons and devices. Conversations to be protected need to have, again, we keep coming back to this expectation of privacy. So in 1966 in Hoffa v. U.S., the government had charged Hoffa, an important union official, with violations of the Taft-Hartley Act. The critical issue was whether the government could place an informant into deliberations of the defense, even when communications with defense's lawyers were happening. And the court ruled that these conversations were voluntary, and therefore there was no violation of the Fourth, Fifth, or Sixth Amendments. So originally, when we look at electronic surveillance, we're focusing on issues of trespass. So the, do the police have to trespass in order to place the tap? Wiretaps on public phones didn't require a warrant because it's a public phone. Gradually, the standard is changed by the court. And the law regarding this is constantly changing. Because if you think about our technology today, um, you know, trespass isn't really necessary in order to gain access to someone's phone. So the key issue then becomes this expectation of privacy, not the location of the conversation. And eventually statutes are passed to regulate the procedure. So in Katz v. U.S. in 1967, Katz is using a payphone to operate an illegal gambling scheme. So the police go ahead and they record the conversations without a warrant. Um, the Supreme Court excluded the tapes and said people with a reasonable expectation of privacy in their conversation are protected by the Fourth Amendment. And I believe the issue here had to do with how the public phone was set up. So you guys probably, most of you guys are not familiar with public pay phones, but there used to be ones that like were a little booth and you could go in and shut the booth. And the idea was that if you're shutting the booth, um, you know, if you're shutting the door to the booth then you're, you're basically saying you have some expectation of privacy. So the Electronic Surveillance and Wiretap Act of 1968 does not cover consensual taps, pen registers, which are records of outgoing calls, trap and trace, which is basically your caller ID records, and calls where there's no expectation of privacy, such as to or from an inmate in prison. Okay, so most, 85% of the warrants here were for drug cases, and 98% were to tap cell phones. So a wiretap act has, makes it a felony to place an illegal tap on someone's, uh, to, to place an illegal tap, okay? And that would cover writing, sound, image, and data. And then that illegally gathered evidence would not be admissible. Under the Patriot Act, the Patriot Act extended coverage to more types of communication, like email and voicemail, and loosened some standards in the name of national security. So in order to apply for a tap, you have to apply to a federal judge and only for certain crimes. While it covers most felonies, uh, the Patriot Act expanded it to cover terrorism. Um, in the application, you have to identify who is applying for the tap. Uh, and generally, a senior officer has approved application. As, and there needs to be a senior officer who's approved the application. You need to provide complete facts about the case, including probable cause. So the details of the crime, where, who, and what... Um, where, who, and how the intercept is to be carried out. So there are, um, you have to also make sure that you've exhausted any other alternatives to wiretapping. You have to indicate how long the tap will last and include any records of previous taps and their results. Uh, so the tap is issued for a specific period of time, but it can be renewed. And you can apply for an emergency tap where you place the tap immediately um, and then retroactively apply for a warrant. Okay, you have to make a record of the tap and keep it for 10 years. And the target of the tap has to be notified within 90 days of the end of it. Um, and there are very strict exclusionary rules that apply here. So let's look at this 1979 case, Dahlia v. U.S. The police, in order to place a tap, had to covertly enter a residence. And the court held that police can enter homes secretly to place such taps and that an information gathered by such taps are admissible. In U.S. versus U.S. District Court Keith in 1972, three suspects were charged with destroying government property. The police had placed taps without warrant, claiming an exception under the OCC and SS Act, as it was a plot to overthrow the government. 
The Supreme Court disagreed, uh, requiring that in domestic cases, the Fourth Amendment must be applied. Okay, in 1986, Congress passes the Electronic Communication Privacy Act, which allows police to ac allows police access to stored information by either subpoena or search warrant. Um, if you're accessing it immediately or from home, you generally need a warrant. And if it's stored information, then you only need a subpoena. FISA. This is where most um, wiretaps and taps uh, and electronic surveillance originate. Uh, it's the Foreign Intelligence, Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978. So this allows TAPS to combat foreign powers, and the U.S. Patriot Act expanded it further. So there's an 11-judge panel appointed by the Supreme Court, and they, I think in their entire history, they've only denied one FISA request. Um, so they basically grant electronic surveillance warrants that are first reviewed by the Attorney General, and now it covers more targets and for longer periods of time, and sometimes you can place a TAP for up to a year with, and sometimes without warrants. So a FISA warrant has to identify, first we need the identity of the federal officer filing the application, the identity of the target. You need to provide facts that sustain a belief of danger and the target would be a foreign power. Um, you need to talk about how you're going to minimize the intrusion, what information is sought. It needs to be certified by a presidential assistant. You need to note how their surveillance will be done, any previous applications and surveillance, and how long the tap will run. So after 1994, it allowed for physical searches. As far as judicial review goes, you have to show that it falls under a foreign power or agent, and that's very broadly defined. Business records, you can file a request for FISA judges to get records, and no probable cause is required, but you must show the records relate to or are in the custody or control of a foreign power. So we can also issue what's called a national security letter, and this does not require judicial review. It's simply a request from law enforcement to a third party that holds a suspect's records. And it also requires the third party to keep the fact that the government has requested those records a secret. It has to, however, involve a foreign counterintelligence case. Okay, and that wraps up a um, brief overview of foreign intelligence.